All right, welcome everybody. So we're starting another flipped lecture. This one will be three parts. Part one is going to focus on the cotton gin in the South. Part two is going to focus on the reasons why textiles will be the first industry, well, one of the first industries that will truly industrialize in the United States. And then the third part, which we'll do in class, we'll look in much more in depth on the Lowell system, its rise and its, well, not fall, but shift away from its original noble intentions. So in order to set up your notes, this is how you might want to set it up. All right, this is going to be the basic flow of the lecture. When you walk away, you should be able to understand that the cotton gin represents a turning point in American industrialization, especially a turning point in Southern history. Second thing is why textiles are the first to industrialize. Why is this going to be an entry point industry? We can talk about guns, also a very important entry point industry, but we're going to, we're going to look at textiles. That's going to be our exemplary. Uh, and then the second two things we'll explain in class in more depth, but you can write them down and have them be there. Uh, and so you can sort of understand um, how, why America is going to try a different model and then that model will fail. But let's get to that in class. Let's just get ahead and go for it. So background information before we get to anything with the cotton gin, there's a big long list of things, right? In order to have a market revolution, aka in order to industrialize in your nation, there has to be a series of things all happening kind of at the same time. And what, by looking at the textile industry, we're going to be able to cover almost all of these things, from why there was an available labor force in New England, to why there was investment capital, and we've talked about this already, why, you know, and we're going to see how these things will feed off and build all of the others. Don't hit them all. We're not going to talk much about stable government enforcing contracts. We, we've learned about the Marshall Court, so you know that that already is in existence. You know about the Constitution. That that's a, that is a key part of the Constitution, is the government enforced contracts. But a lot of these others will be hit by the, uh, the textile industry. So is the textile industry the most important industry? Maybe. Um, but more, it's going to explain how all of these things sort of fit together. And so... That's our, right, we just threw it in there, nice little image of a textile mill. Um, you can see the scale, you can see the size, uh, and so we're going to talk more about that. That's where we're going to end up. But as always, you got to start the story at the beginning. And the beginning for us is going to take into a place, take part in two places. The South, with the availability of cheap cotton, is going to fuel this industry. And it's going to take place in England, and we'll get to that when we do our class lecture. So first of all, we're all a bunch of Yankees, let's admit it, all right? And most of us have probably never actually seen a cotton plant. Cotton is a, you know, knee-high to waist-high crop that requires very intensive labor. When you plant it, this is a young cotton bowl, B-O-L-L -L is the word that you should learn. That's a bowl, it's what, it's gonna, more like a flower, is kind of way of thinking of it. And that's a ripe cotton bowl. And so when people are picking cotton, they're picking this. Those leaves are quite sharp in their edges. And when you pick that, the type of cotton that grows well in the United States is called short staple cotton. You can grow long staple cotton in Egypt, and you can grow long staple cotton in a couple South Carolina islands. For the most part, the vast interior of the United States can only grow this type of short staple cotton. Here's the thing about short staple cotton, the seeds. Inside of that, the fibers are tightly wrapped around the seeds. And you probably noticed your shirts do not contain seeds woven into them. So you have to remove those seeds in order to access the fibers and have the fibers become usable for spinning and then eventually weaving into cloth. The problem with that this is going to take hours upon hours upon hours to remove those seeds. It's very, very labor intensive. So labor intensive, in fact, that you couldn't ever make money off of this crop. If you were going to have, even if you had enslaved people, picking out the seeds would take them so long that the amount of time they would spend 
versus the amount of saleable product that you would have would be, it would be useless. It's not profitable. What's going to make this crop profitable, as you probably already know, is the cotton gin. The cotton gin is an amazingly simple invention. For being as revolutionary as it was, it is essentially a comb and a brush that move in opposite directions. The comb pulls off the fibers, more or less rips off the fibers. The seeds get caught in that metal grate that you can see right here. But the problem is, as we know, if you comb your hair, your brush gets full of your hair. Well, the comb, the, the brush will get, or the comb right there would say, will get full of the fibers. So the brush moves in an opposite direction and brushes off the comb. In one side goes cotton bowls with seeds, at the other side comes clean, fluffy cotton. And bonus, you get a bunch of seeds for planting and harvesting next year. So the cotton gin, potentially invented by Eli Whitney, potentially invent invented by someone else, probably invented by a couple people. As, as I said, it's not that complicated of an invention. The time was right, the demand was high, it was someone was going to figure this out. So the cotton gin is going to create a massive change. Remember that date, 1793, because that's going to be our starting point. So the slave population in 1790, as you can see here, scrunched on the East Coast. There's a few slaves in Kentucky, there's a few slaves in Central Tennessee, but for the most part, we're talking slavery is still dominant in the Chesapeake and on the Eastern Seaboard, much like the American population is still on the Eastern Seaboard. So every time I click the button, you're going to see 10 years progress. So 1790, 1800, not a massive change. Let's go back and forth. Not huge, right? right? The cotton gin has only been around for a few years, so we haven't really had time to plant, harvest, develop, increase our slave population. We can still import slaves at this point, but by here you cannot. And so in 1810, that's a pretty significant change. And the major change you can probably see is Louisiana. Along the Mississippi River, we're starting to have slaves there. Going forward, 1820, 30, 40, 50. All right, and so what we see is this line gets developed here, starting in South Carolina, going through central Georgia, south central Alabama, back up into Mississippi, and then down along the Mississippi River. This is the cotton belt. This is the land that can support cotton growth. And notice right, sorry, notice here, all right, that's where the Cherokee live. Right? And we'll get to that. We've talked about that already. So cotton production, we're going to start this one in 1820. And this one's going to be way more impressive, although impressive is the wrong word, but this should be fairly startling. The westward is spread and the increase in the number of slaves. 2,000 bales of cotton each dot represents. Right? We can see here the cotton land being grown in 1820. This is 27 years after the cotton gin was invented. And you're going to see pretty impressive growth in an industry. Here we go. 30, 40, 50. Boom! That is ridiculous. All right, so that right there demonstrates on the eve of the Civil War in 1860, cotton has become the major industry. While you could say in 1820, it's important. By 1860, it's the king. And they called it King Cotton for a reason. You can see the same exact cotton belt if you look at slaves per farm. So slaves that lived on cotton plantations tended to live on the largest plantations. Slaves that lived on other types of plantations lived on much smaller plantations. And so you can see in this belt again, going down through Georgia, right through here. And then when you guys read Uncle Tom's Cabin in English class, Tom is going to go from here, an area with small plantations, an area that prides itself as being quite good to their slaves, all the way down to here, which is the area that scared slaves the most. Or if you read Huck Finn, Huck and Jim start about here in right near Cairo, and they come all the way down. And as they go down the river, they're descending into the scariest regions for if for any slave. So Jim is descending into the place with the largest plantations, the most brutal treatment of slaves, and the harshest labor. 
which is makes Huck Finn so deeply interesting. So this video called New York Divided was done by the New York Historical Society. And the New York Historical Society is going to be looking at the connections between North and South, but mainly out of New York. So we could definitely look at the connections between you know, slavery's impact on New England with the cotton, with the textile mills. This one does it so well. And so it's telling the story of slaves existed in the North for years and years and years. But the beginning of the market revolution and a little earlier for other states, you see states abandon slavery in the North. It's not practical, it's dangerous. Southern states, far from. Southern states need slavery and they will never let it go because it is the backbone of that cotton economy that you see. By the way, if you want to listen to this on your own without my voiceover, you are more than, I have a link down in the YouTube text. So cotton used to be deeply expensive. And so women, when they wore clothes, would wear very, you know, one layer of clothes. I shouldn't say very few clothes because they were covered head to toe. But when this becomes mechanized, the price will be cut. And I'm not talking any small cut price. We're talking about dollar per yard to penny per yard. We're talking about a, 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 almost a 99% reduction in the price. As you can see, women's clothing becomes larger as a result. The more you can sort of, the more cloth you can afford, the more sort of layers of cloth women wear. We'll talk more about that later. So, here we go, just a quick demonstration of, it's difficult to pull the seeds, and a quick demonstration of a cotton gin. It's not quite that simple and easy, but there you go. So one of the kind of, so what we see is that we've talked about with Jackson, this kind of push for Western land in order to grow cotton um, is a, uh, it's going to be pushed forth not only by cotton growth, but by other forces as well. And the, um, I'm sorry. So I lost my train of thought there. I'm going to pause it for a second. Sorry about that. Lost my train of thought, as I said. So one sort of misunderstanding of the cotton gin is that it makes the life of slaves easier. And as we talked about when we read the Larkin article, it doesn't because cotton itself requires 16 times or 30 times, depending on who you ask, more labor than growing other crops like vegetables. And so when you have the production of cotton being a big industry, slaves will have to grow more and more and more cotton. Life will become more and more harsh, longer, penalties will become worse. Uh, and so cotton plantations will be the worst place for slaves to live. So let me continue this movie now. You can see, see what we're talking about. American have this hunger for land. It's hunger for cotton growing land. It's hunger for other land too. As we've talked about extensively, the Cherokees will, and the other Native American tribes, especially the five civilized tribes, will be pushed out of the southeast. And then a mass movement of slaves from the Chesapeake down to the deep south will happen. Um, you know, this is almost a million. I've seen numbers of 1.1 million slaves will move from the upper south to the lower south. The southern economy booms. Towns should be read as towns, not cities. The South will not become urbanized like the North will be. But here's how the North is connected. The goods, because of the Erie Canal, goods are coming into, international goods are all coming through New York. And now they need goods to move back to England. And so the cotton is going to come into New York, as well as the banks, insurance aid, aid industry, etc. So New York is going to make a bank off this cotton industry, even though they don't grow cotton. And this number is particularly amazing. 30 cents of every dollar earned in the cotton trade was earned by New York in New York City. And so that idea, and that New England also made a significant amount of money off of this. So this is not a Southern phenomenon only. Right, so we could talk about the impact of the cotton gin, but 
we have several things to kind of just run through, and I'm going to be quick about this. Slave owners in Virginia are not going to be able to go cotton, but now they will be able to have their own export, which will be human beings, down to the Deep South. Slave owners in the Deep South will make money, but they will do so by having increasingly large plantations and by having increasingly harsh rules and penalties for their slaves. The type of farming in the South, that's an easy one, shifts to cotton production. Southeast Native Americans, they're going to be forced out because of the deep hunger for land in order to grow cotton. Life of a slave becomes worse because growing, working on a cotton plantation is the most abusive form of American or U.S. slavery. Westward expansion increases, pushes forward. Trading centers like New York become much more sort of international trade comes into much more because now we have something to export that other places want other than just our food. And H is a little more confusing, but because we now have a flow of international income coming in, this is going to basically fund United States banks, and this is going to be where the money comes from to industrialize the rest of the country. It's a little over, a bit of an oversimplification, but it is important. So we have sort of, we could make the argument that slavery and the labor of enslaved people is the thing that allows America to become rich and industrialized. Without that labor to grow cotton would have a negative impact on the North and the South, and we might have remained an underdeveloped nation without it. All right, that's this part of the lecture. Thank you for paying attention. Ran a little longer than I wanted, but um, I, I hope that it was helpful. Be sure to bring any questions you have into class, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks.